883rd meeting of the Board of Directors of MSAD 27. Roll call. Keith Drondro. Here. Kurt Susi. Here. Jake Terrio. Here. Toby Drondro. He's here. Here. Thanks. Barry Lett. Here. Gary Sibley. Here. And Sarah Ashley. Here. Any adjustments to the agenda? We do have um, a couple of adjustments. Uh, under items for information, and I put this in your agenda, a board member, so it's already there. Uh, you're going to add a transfer, a transfer of, sec of the central office personnel to Fort Penn Elementary School, and then under uh, new hires, uh, Fort Penn Elementary School secretary and continuing education secretary. Any public participation? Uh, before we approve the minutes, we're going to kind of get back to the way we used to run the meetings a little bit more. Rather than just everyone speaking up and kind of rambling on, I'm going to ask that you be acknowledged by the chair or vice chair, whichever one of us is running the meeting. Uh, I think that way it just it gives everyone a chance to have some timely input maybe give us a little bit of time to think between questions sometimes. So if we can just be acknowledged before we speak and comment and give everyone a chance to input. Uh, also in talking with Ben, him and his administrative team are very busy right now with everything that's going on. With us individually emailing him and calling him, it takes a lot of time out of his work day makes it a little more difficult to get things done. So from, the, from this point on, if we can just, if you guys have a question, want something added to the agenda, either contact myself or Sarah. We may have the answer, maybe on the agenda already. But we'll just kind of use a chain of command for the board. That would be Sarah. You guys communicating to Sarah and I, we'll go through the event. How would you want to handle like the sports issue? You want us to go direct with like Eric or one of the principals or Yeah, I think I think any I know I know you guys are gonna get bombarded by parents asking you questions and questions and you really you just need to defer them to you know their building administrator, uh, their athletic director, um, because it, it, it's already it, it's already come through me, it's already gone back out to them and of course by the time you get wind of it, you might be first, but chances are, you know, it's already been being uh, worked on. So go right to those building administrators, um, and, and uh, that's the best way for having having parents go directly to them uh, rather than through me. I mean, you're going to feel those questions. They continue to do that. I mean, you're you're going to you're going to do that, but it's, uh, encourage parents to just reach out to those administrators. Everyone good with that. All right, moving on, approval of meeting, approval of minutes for the 882nd meeting. I, I have a couple questions on the minutes. I, there's a couple of items that we talked about that aren't in there. Uh, one in particular was our board's position on site selection. Uh, it's not in there. Uh, we also talked about sending a letter to the other boards telling them on basically our position and what, what, what our expectations are. Basically, the proportionate vote is not in the minutes, so I do not approve it. Because they're incomplete. I think that was probably under the think tank update period when we talked about that. I don't see it in there. No, it's not in there, but I think that's when we talked about it in the last week. Yeah, no, I, you're right. Yeah, uh, Barry, I, I need to go right back. I tell them so. And basically our position was uh, that and a tie vote for us was a no vote as far as for site selection, which means uh, all three parties need to agree and this party doesn't. And, and the other one was to make it very clear to the other districts that we want a proportionate vote. We're not playing. That was very clear. I will be sure to add those in. Do we have a 
second on the motion? We didn't have a motion. Okay. So Gary, can we? At the table. So we're, we're tabling the minutes, right? Right. Okay. But did you and Toby draft the letter? Our attorney's working on that. It should be ready tomorrow. Okay. Which, before it goes anywhere, it's obviously going to go to the board here for review. It. It's nice when we're meeting. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, it's nice when we are meeting. Right now, once we, I think it's necessary. Not fun. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Uh, <coughs> items of old business. Reintegration. <coughs> um, before we get to that, I, I just noticed that Toby was kicked off. <coughs> just want to make sure he's not. Toby, Toby, are you back with us? I will. Uh, it, it was too vague of a statement, so they removed that. 
uh, and, and that's, um, that's, that's been helpful because other challenges is really wide open. So that's one update. Uh, we put a link to the CDC guidance uh, for face masks on page 11, uh, which has been really helpful. And this link right here talks about why certain masks are better than others. It talks about the mask with the vent on the side not being a good idea for a specific reason. And it talks about why face shields are not as, uh, currently not as recommended as the face mask. So we just put that link in there. Uh, for, for, for reference for folks. We, uh, we updated transportation. Uh, transportation was, was updated on Tuesday in an uh, email to superintendents. And now with that new language, um, that, that guided students will sit two per seat. Buses will not be filled to maximum capacity. Uh, and the two per seat is not, it's not straight across the board. Um, with the, the, the bigger high school kids, we're still gonna keep one per seat. Um, with the smaller children, we're gonna try more two per seat. At no time will we ever reach capacity of the bus. Um, but with the new guidance that we are to uh, not fill the bus to capacity, we feel that this is, um, this is well within those, those guidelines. And then with child nutrition, we, we updated the child nutrition information to explain that Remote learners can have access to the school lunch program. Uh, they just need to make arrangements to pick up those meals. We will not be delivering um, with, with that. So those are the updates to the actual plan. Um, I also, uh, we, we also created a, a, um, a staff guide. So there's been questions coming in. I believe I shared with you guys last night questions of the union had the teachers and our answers to those questions. Um, we've been working on this um, all week long, a specific guide just for staff that we feel is going to be useful because it, it although the plan is, is, has a lot of information, this one's very specific to what staff do. So for example, and I know Jake asked a question today, um, the email, email about, you know, how are staff gonna know about travel restrictions and, and when they feel symptoms, should they come to work? So we have a, uh, an assessment action table in our plan that, that it describes if you have symptoms and you've, uh, you've been in close contact with a, a, a person who's tested positive or you've traveled to states outside of the, the allowable uh, travel states. Um, you know, you should be getting tested and you should be quarantining until those test results. So this flowchart can be very helpful for folks. Um, as we're talking to the teachers union and we're talking to our administrators, we're trying to encourage our, our, our staff to make sure they're open and honest and upfront about, you know, when they are traveling, when they are uh, entertaining guests in their home who may be coming from a, a place where um, the infection rate is higher and how to distance yourself within your home and make that happen. So we feel that this is going to be beneficial. We put the information all as well for the Families First Coronavirus Act. So we've had staff ask about how they're supposed to get sick days when they become ill or if they become ill. So we have the information from the, from the uh, Sick Leave Act for them. We're trying to add as much as we can uh, to, to answer the questions that, that people will have before they return to work how we're handling physical distancing in the, in the, in the rooms. And uh, you know, all of, the, all of the important topics we're adding to this, talking about the hand hygiene program that we, we're putting in place for them uh, to help with their students and how you know, we want them to manage student play. So it, it's, it's as thoughtful as you know, all the way down to student play. Uh, we'll continue to edit this on the fly, but we felt that this is definitely something that the staff uh, will need to have. In front of you, you also have survey data. I did want to share with you the survey data uh, that has come in so far uh, to our schools. And um, you can see on the first page with respect to the staff integration uh, for CHS. So which staff are, are um, returning, which staff may not be returning. Uh, you can see so far today there's been 18 uh, responses, 100% of the CHS, our VRMS staff are coming to work. Um, we can see who is going to need face masks from us versus who is going to bring their own. Um, they all want supplies to help clean their classroom. Um, we can see who needs, how many need social and emotional supports uh, from, from us. 
and who will need a thermometer for their morning self-checks. So all that data coming in and it's very helpful in the planning stages for Mr. Coletta and Mr. Doucet. Uh, same thing for Fort Penn Elementary staff. A um, little more responses on that. Uh, we can see that at least one teacher may be getting a doctor's note to, uh, to, to remote teach from home. Um, we, we do see that, um, that um, we have staff that need face masks from us or they might get a doctor's note for a face shield. Um, we then asked, this was asked to the elementary teachers, not the high school, because the elementary teachers will have the option to be solely a remote teacher if they so, so choose from work because of the numbers of kids that we need to, to manage that. We do have some staff um, that would be willing, six elementary staff would be willing to manage remote learning. So that's gonna be very helpful when we're dividing the, the teaching responsibilities. Uh, who's going to be wanting cleaning supplies, so on and so forth, so really good data here as well. The real important data uh, is the student data, how many students are coming back to school. You can see uh, in the next section, CHS student data. Uh, sorry. Right here. A lot of the, not a lot, but some of this data is repeat data because we are, as you noticed from your four o'clock phone call, text and emails that you're probably getting. Uh, some folks are just responding twice to the survey, like, did I respond to that? And so we're getting repeat data, which is okay. We can sort through on the, on the table, um, you know, repeats and then delete some of those. But right now we're at, for uh, CHS, 398 responses across the grade levels. And we can see right now approximately 13.5% are reporting that they will remote learn. Uh, and we have one student that uh, will be um, registering for homeschooling between grades 7 and 12. Uh, so that, that gives us a picture, okay, so about 14%. Now we can start to think about how, how to manage that and, and how that looks. We can also see the student transportation, what that looks like. So about 152, uh, a little less than 50% will rely on bus transportation, uh, what they're saying right now. Uh, we realize that could change. And um, we can also see who needs face masks from the school. We can see as well um, who is going to need some some uh, social, uh, emotional, or behavioral supports, which is you know, good data to have as well, and which families are going to need a thermometer. For the remote learners, we can see who uh, will need technology from us. Uh, we can see who is, um, is, is, does not have sufficient internet. So th this raises the question. So we have a learner out of the 54 that is choosing remote learning but does not have the internet to support it. So this is a conversation we're going to have to have with the family on how do you suppose that's going to work without internet and you're learning from home. Um, so that'll be a one-on-one -on -one case where we'll see what the, what, what the answer is, how the answer is live. Uh, and then finally, the Fort Kent Elementary data. You can see that for Fort Kent Elementary, approximately 439 responses. I guess some are repeat responses. Uh, about 83% will be coming back to school, about 12% remote learning, and uh, about 5.5% um, going with homeschooling. I will admit to you, between the three districts, homeschool notifications are on the increase this year. It's twofold. One is this, and another one is the, um, the uh, mandatory vaccination thing that's coming down the pipe. Um, some, some folks are, are foreseeing that as would be a problem. So homeschooling is on the rise. Uh, we continue to support homeschool learners as best we can. Uh, transportation, higher on the elementary side. Obviously, they don't drive, so more of them need the bus. So about 60% will be using the bus. So we still have quite a few students that are going to be using our buses. And if we're filling our buses at 50% to 60% capacity, um, we, we feel that that might mean longer um, longer time for the kids to come in and go home just based on multiple bus runs, but we're going to try to get uh, as creative as, as we can. I can tell you that Peter Sose is definitely um, on top of it, but it is, it is a concern, you know, of how that's all going to work. Um, so we have the face mask data, we also have the social emotional health data, and the thermometer data as well, and um, remote learning, what's happening there as well. 
a lot of data to sift through. The next step, so when, when a parent submits this, it comes to a form like you see here, but what we see on our side, so this is the Fort Kennel metric, we see on our side, all of that data is compiled into a, a massive spreadsheet. So we can sort by name, by grade level, we can, we can create tables. Mr. Neto is really good about creating tables where he can identify immediately um, which learners are, are, are needing transportation, which are not. So we can sort through that data, we can identify the, the duplicates. Um, that just takes time now. Now it's to go through that and, and start calling the families that we're not hearing from. Um, Mr. Neto, about what percent of families have we yet to hear from you? Uh, well, last time I checked, that's for two. They only say that three of the eight responses, so we're expecting about 80 more. Okay, well, so 80 more, and, and you know that those notifications are out daily, so these are the same. You said a couple days ago we were waiting on 100 and the right amount of responses, yeah, so we're hoping we to continue to switch K-12 to make sure we're going to get those soon. Um, and that, that's, that just takes time. Any questions on the survey? Surveys are outstanding. I think it was outstanding. I have one question on the month or the day that state counts the people that are counted for tuition or for money from the state. Uh, the, the I think it's October, September, October. It's October first. Is it one day or is it a month? It's October first. We, we, we they take a snapshot of what happened on October first. They give us until October thirty to. to compile that, but it's called the October Can we first invite week. a whole pile of people to come on that day? We can. Very good. Uh, we'll have all I'm the highly We'll have like an open house <laughs> council there, and uh, they'll all come in. Now, uh, that, that is the date that we use, October okay. 1. How do the bus numbers percentages compare to last year? On who's planning on using, who isn't? Do we have any idea? It, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to gauge just because you don't know if the, if it's the same kids that are Yes, we'll use the bus or no. That's that's the next stage of this. Now that we have this, you know, Peter has a, a, a program called Transfinder, and he's manually importing the yeses and the noes right now to cross check. Um, typically, you know, you take a bus like like Denny Meadows, which is a 77 passenger bus. Denny has a hundred and over a hundred kids on his list. A hundred kids never ride the bus. Obviously, it's only a 77 passenger bus, but. Then he has had up to 65 kids use the bus before. So it all it all depends on where the numbers lie and, and hopefully we'll be able to cross-check that a little bit sooner than later. Any other questions on the data? Oh, the number of parents that were contacted. You indicated uh, Steve uh, Hubbity. How many have not responded from the high school? Uh, like I said, a couple days ago it was at 100, but our secretaries have been calling all day long, trying to reach families and encourage them to, to uh, do the uh, survey as soon as possible. And uh, the district has been sending out uh, notice for the surveys as well. We've pushed it out social media pages. Our, it's on our, uh, our web pages, the school web pages. It's on the Valley Unified page. Really trying to push out and make sure that folks that really does impact that really does impact uh, the number of students you know a teacher would have in the classroom. Right. So, is there anything else that you can do at this point to try to put a little pressure on those parents because they're kind of sitting on it? Maybe they ought to be told that unless you hear from them in the next 24 to 48 hours that maybe they should consider homeschooling. I think that what I think you're going to put a little pressure on these parents yeah. because you know they're going to sit on it, but it impacts the quality of education that's going to happen in these buildings. What we can do is when we identify exactly who has not responded, um, we can actually send those alerts specifically to those families. So we do a custom list so that not everyone is bombarded by the cars, right. and that those might go out two, three times a day at that point. Yeah, you're right. right. You know they might become a little annoying, uh, which we don't want to annoy people, but we need answers. Um, but specifically to answer your question, Mr. Susie, what do we need to get more of this? We're, we're going to need a little time. I think, you know, I've shared that with you last night. Um, a little bit more time will definitely help with this and, and a couple of other things as well that uh, we'd like you to consider. So that's what I have for survey data. Um, 
wanted to update you on what we've been buying. So this is our spreadsheet for uh, CRF funds, care funds, uh, equipment purchase. We're, we're keeping everything um, detailed and itemized just because we need to make sure that um, the reimbursements on this are, are going to happen. Um, a lot of it is, is cleaning supplies. A lot of it is PPE, uh, face masks, uh, you know, thermometers, um, hand sanitizer, wipes, I mean, everything you can think of. Um, technology supplies are, are, are a big thing. Uh, you know, water, water bottle filling stations. So really all things specific to, um, to this pandemic. One of the big ticket items that we've recently purchased, uh, we're getting individual death shields for every student. Uh, even though right now the guidance from the department is to wear these, or a face shield for yourself. We feel that the desk shield, the partition, is only added security, and we feel that when these phase out, that might be the next guidance, that you have a barrier, because that's what you see at Shop and Save, that, that quickly as you see those plexiglass dividers. We look at different units, some that were um, you know, four by four for the middle of tables. Uh, they have different uh, structures, but at the end we felt what better than a trifold where a student can take it with them to another class and uh, they each have their own independent one. And they'll also double as privacy shields so you can actually tape you know, a, a piece of paper on the inside of those so when students are taking assessments they have privacy, um, privacy in taking that. Um, so we felt you know, it, it also has a purpose beyond just um, with this pandemic. So that was a big ticket item. Um, we're going to continue to look at it, uh, you know, we're getting technology for all the teachers. Every teacher will have a webcam, although we have a camera on our, on our computers that face us. When teachers, especially our high school teachers, are going to be teaching remote learners from home as they're teaching in front of their class, they're going to need a camera that's going to be placed, you know, closer to them that, that focuses on their teaching so that students have that. Uh, we're also getting teachers um, an iPad so that they have um, the camera from, function from the iPad and also um, the, the, the various Zoom functions where <coughs> they don't have to be sitting behind a, a, a desktop computer or a laptop computer or holding it while they're trying to navigate both worlds. Uh, having that iPad in their hand is gonna be a lot more fluid, a lot more flexible, uh, so that's something as well. So right now, we are uh, just shy of $89,000 of purchases as I shared with you last time. We have over 709,000 in, in CRF funds. These funds will, will gonna go a long way in helping us prepare and, and really think about it. And we, unfortunately, we, we don't know yet all the, oh, we need this, oh, we need that. Um, but definitely, we're gonna look at it. Um, I know you guys have approved a, the, the uh, construction approval for the safety vestibule here at Fort Penn Elementary School, where we're putting the double doors uh, as a safety vestibule. We're looking at that now for the high school as a COVID-19 safety pro protocol, where we're doing the temperature monitoring. We'd like to have the second set of doors there. Uh, it's gonna serve as a sa both safety, safety from intruders, but also safety because of this pandemic. So we're gonna look at doing some building improvements through these funds as well, as long as they serve you know, a reason because of the pandemic. So that's something we're looking at as well. I have a, a couple of questions. One is, um, are any of these supplies completely, completely necessary or that you have to have before we start? Yeah, the, the things that we do not currently have that we definitely need are the PPE uh, supplies. Um, we, we did a massive order through the main Department of Education. They had all of us go through and, and do a mass order that's going to be delivered by the main National Guard. We heard they may come next week. We don't know if it's coming next week. So that's the big thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, other than that, we're pretty well prepared. We, we do need a few more days to, uh, to, to finish up signage and, and that type of thing and getting our safety protocols in place. Um, but we need the PPE. The M95 masks for our nurses and our first responders, uh, we need test fitting for those. Those are really key components that we definitely need. If you didn't get them, would you delay the oh, Mr. If uh, you didn't get them, would you delay the start of school? I, I'm gonna ask you to approve us to a delay for the start of school. Um, if, if another week goes by and we're in the same spot, 
I don't know that I'll feel any safer. You know what I mean? <laughs> we, we need PPE. But I hate kicking this can down the road, but I think, I think the department for God that Winston County starts, you know, a little earlier than the rest of the state. So um, we've ordered our own stuff, and we have our own stuff. You know, we have disposable paper masks, but as you saw from the families that need things, we're going to be supplying families with, to start, our own supplies, and that's going to heat up quick before we get the real supplies. So we're hoping to have everything in place um, and feel secure about that. Not, not, to, not to sound negative or anything, but I order supplies every day, and they usually only, only get half by the end of the To buy from Canada, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I could. Um, equipment update. Um, I gave you the handbook. So the last piece to this um, is the calendar um, that I think would be a prudent adjustment to make based on all of the information I, I, I shared with you, the PPE. Um, Technology back orders, uh, we, we were originally not going to order the webcams because the iPads had the camera functionality. Uh, iPads are on back order until mid-October. Yes. Mid-October, we needed something next week for teachers to train on. Uh, so we ordered the webcams, those are coming in hopefully Monday or Tuesday, uh, we need them for staff training. Um, M95 mass testing, that, that's, uh, you know, for sure. PPE shields, we've made our own shields with our 3D printers. We've made about 35, 36 for the district, just, just in case, but those aren't medical shields. And you mean that they're, they're 3D printers that we use in the library, Mr. Meadow and I. And we put a laminated shield, I mean, those are the extent of those masks. So it's better than nothing, but it's not the, the, the same things. And then the numbers are just not, the numbers are not there yet to, to be able to inform our teachers about this is how many kids you're going to have in class, this is how many kids you're going to have um, online. So as I share with you this calendar, it, it's, it's simply a one-week adjustment. Um, the, the previous draft had the, uh, the high school starting uh, this week here. You can see on the big screen they were starting this week here, and now they would be starting uh, the, 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 the following week, the students would now start the 27th and start it instead of the 20th. Uh, in doing that, if we have to adjust the, the um, middle high school, we have to adjust the elementary school so they have the same amount of data because the potato harvest is two weeks. Uh, and we also want the two week barrier to see how it goes with the big kids before we bring the little kids on. So for the littles, uh, staff would have a workshop on Friday because Monday's a holiday. Tuesday and Wednesday, and then the students would start on the 10th. We would not adjust the pre-K. We still think that that's okay for pre-K to start when the big kids leave. Uh, that fits within our plan. Um, so that's five days that we've adjusted. So we had to find five days somewhere in the calendar. We found um, December 23, which is not, it's not a popular day to have a school day, two days before Christmas. I know that because we did it this past year. Um, but we're, we're, going to, we're going to need that day. We're going to have an early release. Um, and, and I mean, we, we just needed to take that day. We also had a vacation day on April 16. That was marked off as a vacation day. We took that day uh, as the second day. Then we added the third day on June 17, the fourth day on June 18. Um, and then the last day would be a staff only day uh, on June, the following Monday. Uh, June 21 is that, and uh, you know we would do our regular thing where it's typically like a barbecue and a wellness, and, and, and really send off our staff uh, for for their well-deserved summer. So this is what we are proposing uh, as as a needed change so that we can prepare for all this stuff that's not in yet. Um, is there any? Flexibility from the department as far as student days go, or even though we're in pandemic, we have to. Nope, the student days are totally flexible. So, my proposal to you would be if we have any snow days this year, we do not make them up for students. We would have a plan in place to have remote, uh, remote PD days for our staff so they have a working day on snow days instead because they have to make up their days, they have to work their one Exactly. In fact, if we, I mean, if we wanted to back up the day, but again, it's a catch-22, right? We, we had a shortened year last year. We, we really want to get these kids. And I keep telling folks, uh, we are so blessed to live where we live. 
and we are able to send our kids to school, we're, we're the envy of the state right now that we can do this without a hybrid model. And I know some people are still scared, but I mean, when you look at our, our, our community uh, spread of the COVID-19 and where it's at, and that it's currently you know, non-existent, that, that's amazing for us to be able to try to capture as many student days as we can uh, and hope that we don't have to go into remote learning. That's my hope. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to, to approve this, provided that we might change it next week. Because <laughs> if we don't have this, the proper supplies, there's no sense we're going forward. Moved so, by Barry, second. second by Pete. Any discussion? Just for the calendar. All those in favor? Yes. Are we getting a Chairman, before, before we start, is Toby with us? Yeah, Toby, do you approve the calendar change? It was a motion by Barry, second by Keith. Thumbs up. I don't know how this remote stuff's going to work. <laughs> Probably can't hear it. You let us know. So do you guys have any questions on the adjustments to the plan other than that? Um, I did, I, go ahead, Dick. Um, that zero to five guidelines that the Northern Bay Medical Center communicated to you as a way to push forward, uh, I, I wanted some clarification associated with that. So if, if a family gets it and the family's five people, then that counts as five active cases and we go to remote learning and hybrid model right away. Or is it, how does, what's the framework for that? Yeah, that's, well, that's, that's a, that's a. And then, for example, the college is assigning one of the houses as an active case, right? So they're secluding their population to get an active case. And they have space for three individuals who are confirmed positive. So that, that I, I feel like, what I'm getting down to is I feel like that zero to five is, is too tight of a, a number for us as a community because if you have one family who gets it, then everyone's remote learning. Except for K-4 and the population we want to bring back to school, right? So I, I just want you to think about it. I'd like a little more flexibility in that because I hate to think that one family coming down with it means that we have to change the way we're doing operating school. My bigger fear, and, and, I, and I totally agree with you, my bigger fear is that we, we only have one or two cases locally or five, and everyone starts pulling back and saying, oh my, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, right? Because we have community, even though it's small, the, the data says you should have less than five for 100,000, which we're never gonna get, right? Um, my fear is that people don't trust the science, but they just look at, you know, an initial knee-jerk reaction. I think, I think this, because this plan is fluid, I think we'd have to look at it by case by case. If it's one family, do we recognize that as one outbreak? You know, if it's contained, I think that's a, that's a valid point. Um, my bigger fear is that, and then, and then we look at our second our column, maybe hybrid then is simply those that feel comfortable continuing because the numbers have dwelled so much towards remote learning. So we won't know until it happens, but absolutely, I think we have to keep it flexible and look at each case by case as a. So you want just keep it five and then call the parents and say. No, I, I think we would okay. consult with, with our health advisor and look at the situation carefully. So part of the, the huddle that we do every morning is we look at we look at the CDC data, but we look at Northern Maine Medical data, and, and we talk about what's happening in both. So we're always going to have that communication, and we we use. Dr. Hart's advice at that time of all. And because, and the fact that we're sharing this, this, this pool of, of active cases with the St. John Valley, I think that's something we have to be aware of too. We have a family in Allagash versus a family in Grand Isle. Or yeah. Not Grand Isle but. Yeah. yeah, I think we do look at it and make a valid choice. Good point. Um, no, I still have a couple more questions. I'm just curious about the teacher, some of the feedback for the remote learning piece. Is yep. there a threshold where you're going to have 
high school teachers are only going to be allowed so many remote learners before they can turn it off and say that the class is helping this population of students is all remote learning and it's, the load is too much for the teacher. Do you guys have a threshold? Yeah, well, yeah, so one, one thing that the high school, and, and that goes for the elementary too as well, we don't want to create, we don't want to create a situation that's not manageable. So, you know, if, if we're looking at a class and, and we're fortunate enough where we have multiple sessions of, of a class. Um, we're not going to put all the remote learners in um, in, in Ms. Leslie Marquis' you know first law biology. We're going to try to spread them between you know the, the others so that we're making it equitable. Right now, with the population that we're seeing being really even and really even across the board, it may look like one or two remote learners per session. Um, so not concerning right now, but we, we definitely have to look at that. Um, if we can free up a, a, you know, a, a space, it's a little bit easier at the middle school where you have general instructors, right? Your, your middle school teachers are generalists, they're not specialists, so they can teach more subjects. If we have to assign a block of time to a middle school teacher to do school remote, we may have to do that. But it all, it all depends on the numbers. Okay. Thank you. Toby just texted and said that he's voting via text via Zoom. Oh, okay. He did it with the camera. Perfect. Thank you. I, sure. I have a question about how, like, similarly, how does that, what does that look like with rise? Mr. Nettle, what does rise look like? Well, so the first thing is, you have to look at the numbers in the so there's a chance that there's the numbers in that cohort that we have to have a rise teacher that might be able to do that. If not, we'll have a more teacher that may not necessarily fill in. Starting from the lower age groups, um, those packets have to be part of what goes to a remote learner's home. Uh, specific to what exactly that framework looks like, uh, we don't want to prescribe everything to, to a, a certain way because the teacher needs some voice and choice in that. So what happens in, uh, in, in Miss Amy's kindergarten class is different than what happens in, in, in another kindergarten class, it's just going to be the same for the remote learner. We want the framework to be workable, and we, we've seen this frame that we know what kids can handle. We know how many hours they can handle based on the grade level. So we're going to give them that framework. Uh, but how much screen time versus how much paper time versus how much um, uh, uh, creative time, we're, we're talking about that not only for our remote learners, but our in classroom learners because we got real comfortable with these through remote learning. I don't want to see this being the new thing when kids are here. So it's that healthy divide of 25% this, 25% that, and that's gonna shadow in remote learning. When do you think you might have something you can present to parents about what a day might look like? I think that'll be like a teacher sending out there, this, when the teacher has their welcome packet, it'll okay. be based on their, um, what they created. Thank you. How, how are you going to deliver the daily paper? Um, U.S. Postal Mail? Lunch? It could be, but we're not, we're, not not delivering, lunch. we're not delivering lunch, but we're, you know, depending well, on our- Well, they're like have lunch, right? They, they're gonna come in for lunch. So perhaps if they come in for lunch, they pick up packets at that, uh, you know, at that time, or when we're doing our, our after-school deliveries of students, we're making arrangements for them to meet the bus for their packets. We'll work with folks. So the remote learners are going to go eat at school? No, they're going to pick up their lunch. 
Right. We're not delivering one to Okay, there you go. We're not right. delivering now one. Now I got it. We need our buses and our drivers. Any additional questions or comments? New business, uh, we have a transfer, uh, central office personnel to Fort Penn Elementary Title I. Uh, today we approved the transfer of Ashley Pelletier, uh, who is central office, um, she, she's accounts payable and, and receptionist. Uh, she wanted a transfer to the vacant Title I Ed Tech 3 position. Um, Ashley really aspires to be a classroom teacher and she wants to get in the classroom now sooner than later, so we felt this was something we should honor as she's been a very dedicated employee uh, for many years. So we, we approved this transfer. It's uh, sad for our office, but Mr. Neto is, is getting a, a, a wonderful Did Lucy Tabor cry? Uh, Lucy Tabor has been crying. She's been uh, crying. Quite a bit. <laughs> I think there are a few, uh, there are a few tears shed today at the, at the office. Um, new hire, I am pleased to announce that we found a trip driver and we are recommending Mr. Charlie Wett to come back and instead of making his wonderful cake, he is going to be driving a trip bus. Do you know what he does whenever he, once he left school? He was trucking. Yeah, yeah. He's an awesome voice. Yeah, and uh, he, he got tired of a long time away from home, and so he was really interested in us. He entertained us. We have a motion to accept Charlie, approve Charlie. Yes, so move. Can I say? Discussion? All those in favor? Very good. Um, in favor? Are you in favor? Oh, oh, you didn't see my hand? <laughs> <laughs> you do have a letter in your packet that I just provided you uh, this evening. Um, we had introduced for the Fort Kent Elementary School, sec uh, school Secretary. Uh, if you remember, Bethany transferred to the Middle High School. Jill transferred to Bethany's position. So uh, there was an opening for, for that. Uh, Mr. Neto and Ms. Bill Kelly and Jill uh, Jandro all interviewed candidates and they are recommending uh, Heidi Babin for the position. Motion by Barry. Second. Second by Tate. Any discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. And at the same time, we were um, also advertising for our continuing ed secretary, uh, and that was vacant because Angela transferred to guidance. Um, and so, um, the faces here and Don LaBelle interviewed candidates, and they are uh, recommending uh, Alicia Labat for going for this position. Second. Second by Kerr. Second. Second by Barry. Any discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. No, it's a transfer. No. Current openings we have uh, two one on one ed techs that are still uh, open at Fort Elementary State School. And now because of Ashley's transfer, we have a central office receptionist accounts payable um, position. The last thing that you have uh, is approval of the CHS DRMS Learner Handbook. And Mr. Doucette gave you that in advance with some, um, some red uh, font to show you what has uh, changed in the handbook. And Mr. Doucette is here to answer your question. Uh, question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, page 35, the top of it. Um, I think with adding additional flexibility to your high school instructors, I would move to strike about allowing students to enroll in college or campuses if they're offered at community high school. And given the fact that rural U and Fort Kent is eliminating fees associated with their programs, the third quarter. Third, uh, the oh, second, second, third, last sentence, uh, post-secondary enrollment and dual enrollment options. Okay, very good. If you want to... This is something that... Uh, 
No. Okay. And I, I think the chairman had a good point. We are in extenuating circumstances. I did want to mention Mr. Jandro online did ask a question if we have release time this year, uh, the religion, religion ed time. Uh, there will be no release time at least to start the year um, because the, 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 it would be unmanageable for the social distancing to happen in the facility that they have the classes. So this is something that Mr. Meadow has spoken to uh, Bob about and we're all on the same page and it's actually the same thing that's happening in the other two communities as well. Uh, we still want to continue it in the future, but given the situation right now, there will be no release time. If any other discussion on the handbook? Okay. I move that we approve it. Barry? You know, problem with the PDA, Barry? I'm just curious about the PDA. Is it kiss on the cheek? Kissing? It's going to be hard with a mask. I was looking at that. It's going to be pretty hard with a mask. It's going to be pretty hard with a mask. Well, then, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't remember it being that big of a deal in high school, but has it been a big deal for you guys to, to deal with? <laughs> you know, I, I appreciate the question. Because um, we're the ones that, that, or our staff, often are the ones that see. They're usually isolated cases where you have, uh, you know, fairly uh, intimate problems that are the ones that we have difficult times to, you know, separate. And uh, it makes a lot of people uncomfortable. It makes the student body uncomfortable. It makes the staff uncomfortable. And we want to have these in writing so that it's not viewed as uh, merely in the or, oh, you're just an old phony. You don't understand what us young folks feel. You know what I mean? Word love. But then when we switch the tables and say, you know, how about what if we were doing things, you know? They quickly, you know, see it our way. But we just wanted it writing. Most of what I've added in there this year is stuff that was not in there. It was um, understood. It was, you know, between the lines kind of stuff. I just wanted to explicitly like lay out like some it. rules a little bit easier. And it makes it easier for us when we have to defend our position, when we say, well, you, either the parent or the child, you read this and you signed this. So, you know, it gives us a little bit more leverage. We just want to keep our, our schools as professional as possible and, uh, and we want to teach these young folks uh, like all lessons. Hey, well, I, I think kissing and hugging is, is a good thing. Maybe it's what? I think kissing and hugging is a good thing. You know, I hug my dad. I think it's a pretty cool thing that well, I. Well, uh, but I, I was not to belabor the point. Not to belabor the point. I. This I, is more slurping than kissing sometimes. You know what I mean? It's different. I I know. I I, I feel I like I peck on the cheek or something or show of you know. We have friends that will do that. You know what I mean? No one's so going to. So you are going to be judicious in how you, so, and how you approach it. Or is it going to be uniform? Only hand holdings allowed, and I can't put my arm around you when we're on the bus. It all it all surrounds the, the level of intimacy. You know what I mean? If it's passion versus just uh, friendliness, and, and you know what I mean, there's a difference. And as an educator, I can tell you that it's difficult to define that and to assess that. Is that too much kissing? You've been kissing for five minutes now. Uh, is your hand where it's supposed to be? No, sir. No. I'm not even going there. I think it's a great policy. I'm glad you have it there. I'm just curious. Right I want to make sure. I second the motion already. Mr. Chairman? Oh. Know that I know that I work with. If it's a kiss on the cheek, or even a kiss on the lips, that's like a, a fleeting moment or holding hands. But we definitely know when it's inappropriate. And uh, so I think it, it's, it's nice to, to, you need to know that no one is the uh, affection police and mm -hmm. 
we're, we're not really monitoring how long it is, but we definitely know the difference. And so I think professionally everyone's going to handle it in a way. Trust me, we do not like going up to people and saying that to kids. It makes us feel very uncomfortable as well, but they know that they're they cost a lot. So I just wanted to share that. something like this, I, and what I've heard from, from people saying it, it's okay sometimes and it's not okay sometimes. And so I, I feel like some people will get away with it and some won't. So I, I hope it's uh, well uh, maintained and practiced and it's uniform across the board. Tobacco and nicotine product paragraph. Is that is that all included with the cigarettes as well in that policy? Yes. 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 Most places that we're talking about, uh, that's why last year yes. we included the word nicotine because there's right. other nicotine products out there now. Right. Right. So things like uh, e cigarettes and uh, you know, even gum and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. they want to If there's anything that happens in the meantime, you'll let us know. We can call it from tenfold. Second. Yep. Twenty-four. Second. Twenty-four. Twenty-four. Then six. Probably good. Yeah. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Someone. I'll second it. All those in favor. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you, Toby.